Thank you for joining us on the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison, uh, teach at Suffolk University, and our guest today is Jim McIntyre, James McIntyre, a military historian. He has written a biography of Johann Ewald, a Jaeger commander in the Revolutionary, actually in the Seven Years' War, the Revolutionary War, and in the Napoleonic Wars, and he also edited Thoughts of a Hessian Officer, which was um, Colonel Avold's thoughts on guerrilla warfare. But he's here to talk to us today. And he, you teach at the Moraine Valley Community College in Palos Hills, Illinois, as well as at the Naval War College. So, so Jim, I'll let you get a word in edgewise. I'm just trying to get through <laughs> your credentials for speaking to us as a military historian. And you're not here to talk about any of those things. Instead, we're going to talk about Fort Mercer in New Jersey. Welcome, Jim McIntyre. Thank you, Bob. And it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And so, yes, uh, well, Avald has a connection to F Fort Mercer or the battle at Red Bank. Uh, he's part of the, the Jaeger contingent that goes along under this, this 1,100 strong Hessian force um, under Colonel Count Emil von Donop. And so the idea is that a big part of this project was looking at the latter stages of the Philadelphia campaign. Um, you know, most of the time we think about Philadelphia campaign in 70, 1777 and it's Brandywine, Germantown, and that's it. But there's two months of major efforts on the part of crown forces to gain control of the Delaware river uh, right. against the defense and depth that the Americans right. had constructed. Now, this is why the British had come up from the Chesapeake, because the Americans had fortified the lower Delaware to prevent access to Philadelphia, I believe. Yes. Um, that. What's interesting is there's really no conclusive evidence. There's a, there's a Captain Andrew Snape Hammond on the HMS Roebuck, a British frigate on patrol in the Delaware Capes. He's very familiar with the Delaware def River defenses. And he meets with the Howe brothers on the Eagle. And then in his own account, Hammond talks about, they escorted me out of uh, Admiral Howe's quarters. And 30 minutes later came out and said, we're going to the Chesapeake. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and, and he's like, what about Wilmington? Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. So these two forts, Fort Mercer and Fort Mifflin, the Americans had built as a way of protecting the Delaware, and if could the British have held on to Philadelphia had they not had control of the Delaware River? Um, probably not, because uh, following Germantown, Washington basically spread disperses his army somewhat, uh, and they cover the main roads into the city to prevent supplies from getting in. So the British are really dependent on the fleet. There's a trickle that they managed to get up Wilmington via the road network into the city. Um, but the big thing becomes if we can hold the river until it freezes and then the British won't be able to get. And there's a lot of correspondence between Washington um, and the uh, President Lawrence in, mm -hmm. in the Continental Congress back and forth on, you know, how soon can the is the river usually freezing and so forth. Um, but I don't think they, they would have been able to feed their troops plus mm -hmm. the residents of the city. And that was really sort of the goal. Right, right. And so Congress at this time, they've the British have Philadelphia. So Congress has gone up to York. And so Washington is trying to hold on to the Delaware, at least until the river freezes. So how do they go about constructing these forts? What do Fort Mifflin and Fort Mercer look like? Uh, well, the, for Fort Mifflin, it was partially uh, a stone, one stone wall facing southward down the river, and the rest was just wooden stockades. Um, in, in the book that's coming out, uh, Glorious Resistance, there's, there's a pretty, few pretty thorough descriptions, and the major issue was that the construction was started and stopped many times between mm -hmm. 1765 and, and 77 when the 
attack comes. Um, Fort Mercer was actually not much more than a stockade hmm. fort that was um, improved somewhat. In early October, Washington sends the Rhode Island, first and second Rhode Island to garrison Fort Mercer. And along with them, he sends a French engineer, Captain Maudit de Plessis, who surveys the work that had been done and says it's too large for the garrison we have and reduces it by about half. And that plays a critical role in the Hessian attack. Um, but the role of the forts was actually they had sunken several rows of these chevaux de free, these large wooden boxes with... Uh, imagine a pole the, the height of a telephone pole attached to two or three of these attached to each one of the boxes sunk to the bottom of the river to the point where they would be about six feet below uh water level and so that's what's going to prevent the british from getting up the river yeah. and the forts are there to make any attempt to try and move these out of the way very mm -hmm. costly so it to me it really is sort of an interlocking defense in depth right quite an engineering feat then to sink these boxes with the poles on, into the river. Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a Philadelphia architect by the name of Robert Smith who devised them, submitted the design to Congress. And, and one of the things that was um, somewhat maddening in the research is that Smith also devised a machine to uh, fill these boxes once they were positioned in the river to fill them with stone and sink them mm -hmm. in the appropriate spot. And and the other thing that these were each tailored, <clears throat> pardon me, tailor made and designed so that they would go below the water and at each, you know, the, the water, mm -hmm. the floor of the river is not flat. It's so they right. would actually kind of survey it and build these wow. to suit the location. So it's a major mm -hmm. undertaking. But yeah. there's no real description of the machine that he devised wow. yeah. for, for sinking these. Wow, that's amazing. And so he's who pays him for the work? Is this a continental project or a Pennsylvania or New Jersey project? Um, it's a, it's a pe predominantly a Pennsylvania project, mm -hmm. though they do get support from uh, some of the Whigs in Gloucester, who mm -hmm. in Gloucester, New Jersey, which is the county that Red Bank is in, and. Um, they do some of the construction on the Jersey, on the riverbank, on the Jersey side, mm -hmm. uh, and then they haul them out into the river. And it's also the Pennsylvania State Navy that takes part in helping them position these uh, obstructions and then also takes part in the campaign itself. Well, so how effective are they in keeping the British fleet out? Um, well, Interestingly, there's there's nothing I've seen of ships getting damaged by the Chevo, um, mm -hmm. per se. However, it is a major concern because they are they're inching their way up. There's there's a first row that is south at um, basically going across from Chester, Pennsylvania, to Billingsport in New Jersey, and the Americans had a smaller fort at Billingsport than the second main row between Forts Mifflin and Mercer. Um, and it's that main row that, that takes up most of the attention of crown forces between mm -hmm. October and November 16th, which is when Fort Mifflin finally falls. Mm. Uh, okay. So what's the British strategy then of getting at these forts so that they can open up the Delaware? Well, they try a few approaches and, and you know, to get to the battle at Red Bank, um, that's William Howe and, and brother Richard Howe's first sort of major offensive on this upper line of, of obstacles. And so the initial plan was um, that the Royal Navy would come up and bombard Fort Mifflin. Meanwhile, a British land assault force or crown assault force would attack Fort Mercer on the Jersey side. Um, and so between them, they would they would breach these fortifications. Then it's only a matter of just moving the obstruction. Still a, a labor intensive, but they won't be taking fire. Um, mm -hmm. What happens that leads to the battle at Red Bank? Uh, one of the Hessian commanders, uh, von Dunup, 
requests the honor of leading the assault. And he was the overall commander in the area of Trenton the previous year. And so he's really trying to sort of remove the blight on the honor of Hessian forces for this. Right. Trenton. They, they had lost Trenton yeah. to Washington's assault. Yeah. So what can you tell us about Von Donop before we get on to what happens to him in the Battle of Fort Mercer? Was, uh, what's his background? So he serves in the Seven Years' War. Um, he was regarded, in, in some instances, he is, most of his brother officers, and especially subordinate officers, um, don't have a lot of pleasant things to say about him. Though the enlisted men, and uh, Johann Conrad Dola, who is one of, one of the Hessian troops there, actually has some very complimentary things. So he seems like he was more of the enlisted man's officer um, than sort of sticking within this niche of the nobility. Right. So Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So he wants the honor of, we're talking with Jim McIntyre from Moraine Valley Community College about his, and he's uh, one of the authorities on the Delaware campaign and on the Battle of Fort Mercer, which he's about to tell us about with Colonel Von Donop asking for the honor of leading the assault on this American fortification on the New Jersey side of the Delaware River. So, go on, Jim. So what, what happens, Jim? Uh, Hal grants him the, the honor. Uh, then Von Donop asks for some heavy siege artillery. And mm -hmm. interestingly, Hal turns around and says, if you, you know, if you want more cannon, I'll do it myself. So he's forced to go over with field pieces, three pounders, yeah. to yeah. attack a fort. Um, one uh, major uh, Baumeister, one of the other Hessians, records in his diary that Hal had told von Donop to take the fort by coup de main, frontal assault. Ah, wow. And which is which is what happens. They uh, now remember everything, this whole sort of mass attack on the fortifications was slated to go off on October 23rd. Mm -hmm. uh, so the morning of the 21st, the Hessian contingent crosses from the Arch Street Ferry in Philadelphia to Cooper's Ferry, now Camden, in New Jersey. Uh, they march to Haddonfield in New Jersey that day, encountering some resistance from uh, New Jersey militia, mm -hmm. and which is also feeding intelligence of this back to the garrison at Red Bank. Uh, the, the main commander there is Colonel Christopher Green, cousin mm -hmm. of Nathaniel Green. Um, and so they're, the garrison are quite prepared. They, they know this attack is coming. Uh, the following day, the Hessians move out from Haddonfield about 4 a.m. And th there's some pretty extensive skirmishing because they don't get to Red Bank until noon. Hmm. And at which point, Von Donop calls on the fort to surrender. Mm -hmm. They reject the proposal. <laughs> um, yeah. And then Von Donop orders his men to start making, you know, these bundles of sticks, fascines to mm -hmm. that they're going to use to throw in a ditch in front of Fort Mercer when they charge in. And this mm -hmm. takes until four in the afternoon. Wow. And meanwhile, the fort is signaling out to these, these small uh, guard ships and, and gondolas of the Pennsylvania Navy, hey, come in for some help. Um, mm -hmm. When they and, and again, when they finally decide to attack, they were going to attack um, from two directions simultaneously. But remember, they're a day early. Yeah. The British Royal Navy contingent has no idea of this going on. And one of the Hessian mm. columns, uh, the regiment von Langer, jumps off early. Mm. And meanwhile, Duplessis and Green in the fort see what's happening. And as they see the one Hessian assault coming at them, they put most of the garrison to one wall. And as the Hessians come through, um, they just between the garrison and the Pennsylvania ships in the river, unleash this devastating wave of fire, um, turn back the first assault, which had actually mm -hmm. breached the fort, but it was the part the, of the fort that Duplessis had abandoned because, again, he had modified it. Um, so they thought they were going into the fort when actually it's kind of a false fort they've gone into. There's a Yeah. 
And, and did the uh, Americans and the French have artillery inside the fort? Um, not really, but they're getting that artillery support from the river for, because okay. these uh, these are shallow draft, fairly shallow draft. They mount like one gun in the bow for the most yeah, part, yeah. and they're firing grape shot. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. a number of Hessian accounts talking about, you know, we're taking fire in our left flank. And so as mm -hmm. the one attack comes up from the south, you know, they're left is, is facing out to the river. So it's pretty mm -hmm. clear that that's where these Pennsylvania Navy ships are firing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the second attack comes in. Meanwhile, the, the garrison has just enough time to reshuffle within the walls. And, and basically in each assault, they're able to muster the full weight of the two Rhode Island regiments hmm. um, and, and unleash these volleys on their attackers. The end result is about all told on the field um close to 310 killed or wounded wow um, how many how, how many water. men did the uh jaegers and the hessians have i mean how big was the force were they bringing to bear on the fort about 1100 so okay. so we're talking in excess of you know a quarter of yeah the the force um and again including von Donop, the overall commander wow. meanwhile wow. Johann Ewald is the Jaegers were kept in uh, reserve. And so he observes the attack. He actually has some great commentary mm -hmm. um, talking again before they had jumped off. Um, after the second parlay, he asked a, a senior captain, you know, who, who had seen extensive service in the seven years war von Krug. And he goes, basically, what do you think? And, and Krug goes, those, you know, basically a lot of these junior officers think this is going to be easy. Anyone who's seen a place taken sword in hand, we're mm. in for some bloody work. Um, mm. Yeah. And, and, you know, they were. They were. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were. So, okay. So Donop is mortally wounded then. Mm -hmm. So who is, who is in command of this operation then once he is down? Uh, one of the subordinates, uh, von Linsing, takes mm -hmm. over and organizes a retreat there's there's probably another 60 uh well there are another 60 hessians who are either captured or taken prisoner and and in the organizational phase of this um this is where it really becomes horrible for the head you you do feel compassion for the yeah. Hessians. Yeah, yeah. they had no wagons mm. so the seriously wow. wounded officers are strapped to the field pieces wow and wow. the enlisted men oh, wow yeah and the enlisted men have to make their way as best they can wow it's amazing. so yeah. so so are they then trying to make their way back to the ferry to get back to philadelphia they, they start to retreat um, and, and there's some talk that if Green had pursued, he might have been able to really turn this into a complete route. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, they've just fought this engagement. Um, they yeah. spend the night, you know, uh, finding wounded, basically, mm -hmm. including Von Donop. He's he's mm -hmm. wounded with uh, a musket shot to the the hip. Um, he's mm -hmm. taken to this nearby farmhouse, the, the Whittall farmhouse, uh, this Quaker family on whose property Fort Mercer was constructed. Mm -hmm. And he lingers there for about a week. Um, wow. Meanwhile, the remainder, remainder of the Hessian assault force makes their way through the night back to, and, and they may have actually, some may have doubled back. There's some conflicting records. But they make their way back to Cooper's Ferry. Uh, the following mm -hmm. day is when, you know, the, the British send over some more troops to Cooper's Ferry and, and bring them back to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. wow. Meanwhile, um, as, as we were talking about beforehand, when the men on these British Royal Navy ships in the river hear the sounds of the fighting at Red Bank, they oh, well, we're doing this today and, and start to move mm. in and fire on Fort Mifflin. Mm. In the process, okay. um, a ship, um, third rate, the 64-gun HMS Augusta gets stuck on a sandbank and is, it stays there through the night, though the some mm. other Royal Navy ships try and free her. 
-hmm. the Americans realize it the next day and, and fire concentrate their fire from Fort Mifflin and the Pennsylvania Navy ships on the Augusta, which then explodes. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, wow. we're talking with Jim McIntyre about the uh, battle of Fort Mercer in New Jersey one of the un, little known victories. Uh, it's, a, it's not a complete victory because I think the British wind up taking the mm -hmm. fort, but they've so far they've defeated this 1,100 man Hessian and Jaeger assault on it. Now they've taken the 64 gun Augusta, the British warship. That, is that the largest American, largest British vessel that the Americans capture or destroy during the course of the war? Yes. Um... It's it's the largest British vessel we destroy uh, because it it does it and and again it's interesting because a lot of accounts say that a heated cannonball a hot shot from Fort mm -hmm. Fort Mifflin started the fire that went to the main magazine. Um, William Howe in in a letter to Lord Germain back in in London asserts that some wadding from one of the Augusta's own guns started the because right. the Americans could not possibly sing no. a man of war. Um, yeah. Yeah, a, little co a little cover up. Um, we did it. We did it. <laughs> it, was, it was an accident. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, uh, another um, ship, the sloop, the HMS Merlin, which was coming to the Augusta's aid, also gets stuck and catches fire and they abandon it. So they've lost two ships um and this how many ships were they bringing into the assault um it's well they they make their way up in stages so mm -hmm. eventually um you have roughly 10 vessels mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. there's a, a couple of sloops um a gunboat they they actually take two other ships um the vigilant and fury and it essentially hulk them brought them around the the channel behind between fort mifflin or fort island mud island mm -hmm. and the pennsylvania shore lashed them to trees on the shoreline and used them wow. as, as sort of floating batteries oh wow yeah is uh, the delaware river tidal at this point or is it just a uh, flowing river it's um it's flowing river because it's just below the confluence of the Schuylkill and the Delaware, that the, the mm -hmm. Fort Island. Um, and essentially, like, I my first job as a historian was as a docent at Fort the Fort Mifflin wow. Historic Site. And so to, to give everyone a frame of reference, we're essentially, it's, the land has been filled in. It's no longer an island. We're essentially mm -hmm. behind Philadelphia International Airport. <laughs> wow. so. if um so so there is a fort mifflin that people can visit can you tell yes. us more about what it looks like or what it looked like back when you were giving tours yeah oh it's um so the the fort that was there in 1777 was obliterated because it was mostly wood um the the bombardment that the British unleash on November fifteenth is the largest cannonade in North America before Gettysburg. Wow! So that versus a wooden fort, you know, it's yeah. it's nothing's mm -hmm. left. Um, the the remainder of the garrison under Major Simeon Thayer, also part of the Rhode Island contingent, he he had actually volunteered after mm -hmm. uh, two of the commanding officers had been wounded. But mm -hmm. he oversees the final evacuation. Joseph Plum Martin was there as well. Yeah. Um, at any rate, after the war, um, there's a post that's sort of partially rebuilt. Then under the Madison administration in the sort of post-war of 1812 era, they built, you know, when they were building the, the sea defenses up and down the right. coast. And that's what stands there now. It's, it's a Trace Italian style fort. Mm. Um Though some of the blocks that were, because everything gets reused, you can still see pock marks from cannonballs on some of the the wow. stone blocks. Wow. Yeah. Well, wow. so and what is there at Fort Mercer if someone wanted to sketch out the battle? N not there's there's not a great deal. The Whitall House is still standing. The fort mm -hmm. itself was demolished. Um, so following 
when they abandon Fort Mifflin, uh, the Americans retreat to the Jersey side. Meanwhile, or Earl Charles Cornwallis um, brings across another British force um, around mm -hmm. just after Fort Mifflin is, is abandoned. And he's got a total of about 5,000 crown troops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we, we send, re, Washington does send reinforcements. He also sends Nathaniel Green into the area and several, DeKalb and several other uh, of his mm -hmm. trusted subordinates. But it's it's very clear at this point that the numbers the British are bringing in were mm -hmm. so we abandon Fort Mercer and blow it up. There there is mm -hmm. um, an outline of the fort and a monument to the defense um, mm -hmm. that stand there. And there's also a um, one part of one of the chevaux de frise that they found in the river afterwards. Wow, wow! And they've also found pieces of the Augusta in the river. Yes. Um, as, as late as the early 20th century, around 1901, um, I have a picture of the spine, essentially that, you know, main central piece mm -hmm. of the lower hull um, that they dredged. They were dredging the river to open it up for larger shipping and mm -hmm. they found it. And, and every now and then they find, you know, chevaux de free. Um, mm -hmm. At Fort Mifflin, there are a few cannon that probably came off the Augusta. There's mm -hmm. um, the Americans do the the Pennsylvania Navy actually goes down and tries to pull some of the guns off the wreck and bring them to Fort mm -hmm. Mifflin to to add to the defenses there. Mm. Well, wow. we're talking with Jim McIntyre from Moraine Valley Community College in Palos Hills, Illinois, about the uh, campaign along the Delaware River in 1777 after the British had taken the um, Philadelphia. Now they're getting, now you've also written about Johann Ewald and he, he wrote a book about military tactics or about yes. adapting to fighting in this new environment. So he's, he learned something from this experience and from his other experiences. Can you talk a little bit about Johann Ewald? Certainly. Um, so he is born in Cassel, in, in Hess Cassel. Um, he participates, he joins the Hessian army at the ripe old age of 16, um, <laughs> serves in the latter years of the Seven Years' War. Uh, and, and he's a commoner. And so it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. He actually remains in the ranks and is promoted into the officer corps um, in this inner war period. Um, and fights a duel, loses an eye, um, and during his recuperation, uh, starts reading extensively. And so he attends at the permission of the, the Landgrave, who was essentially the, the Count of hess Um, he attends this, uh, Collegium Carolinium. While there, he writes this first book, which I translated on tactics, and it's really sort of his experience, uh, distilling his experiences from the Seven Years' War. Um, he then serves where, over here. Where does here. he fight in the Seven Years' War, Jim? I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Where does he fight in the Seven Years' War? Um, he's in he's in the Western Theater, so he's not mm -hmm. under Frederick. He's under Frederick's brother-in-law, Ferdinand okay. of Brunswick, uh, mm -hmm. fighting the French uh, very often. So Okay, so he's in Europe rather than yes. in North America. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, go on. So no. he's... Um, and he's most known to us for the diary of his experience in the American War, mm -hmm. um, which is still just an outstanding source on the Hessian mm -hmm. perspective. But also looking at it from from, you know, the perspective of like the tactical strategic analysis, mm -hmm. um, he's always talking about like even after, you know, he has a section after he describes the fighting at Red Bank. This is what we did wrong. And he lists, he says, the first thing we should have attacked as soon as we got there, we should, you know, just right. have gone in and gone straight to the attack. Second, um, we should have used one of these attacks as a feint to draw the Americans' attention. And if you think mm -hmm. about it, well, if they're moving the whole garrison to defend against one, that, that that's right. Things yeah. may have ended differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. After the war, he, he and he spends, he, he fights in most of the major engagements from late 76 um, he's, he's actually, he's part of the surrender at Yorktown. 
Mm -hmm. uh, he serves in the siege at Charleston and so forth. Um, after the war, he returns to Europe and he writes extensively on light infantry, irregular, what we would today call irregular warfare. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually ends up because it's uh, going on 1790 and he's, he came here and he was a captain. By right. the 1790s, he's still a captain. Mm -hmm. And so he ends up going to the Danish army um, mm -hmm. and eventually is promoted to general. Mm. Uh, wow. Yeah. So he, but, but he had been a commoner. So did he enter the army just as a, an enlisted man? Yeah, he, he was. Um, he seems to have initially been enlisted in the line, but then he gets a promote. He definitely stands out early to his superiors. Mm -hmm. There's a, um, mm -hmm. a Lieutenant von Schlemmer who essentially takes Ewald under his wing when he first joins mm -hmm. the, the Hessian army. And it, it seems points him out to other officers. He's, he's actually wounded um, in one of the engagements. He's actually wounded several times in the Seven Years' War, uh, as mm -hmm. well as the American War of Independence. Uh, at any rate, when he, was, when he returned to his unit from the field hospital, um, you know, he, he gets promoted to lieutenant so <laughs> and starts his climb but the other thing to realize with that is the the seven years war was was one of those conflicts that just you know noble families were decimated so mm -hmm. by the end of the war a commoner there is this window that a commoner could become an officer okay wow but it was pretty unusual wasn't it oh yes yeah yeah and so uh, now, was there any thinking, Jim, when von Donop wanted the honor of leading the expedition and it fails somewhat spectacularly? Was this why you know, Cornwallis said, OK, we'll do this rather than let the Germans muck it up again? Um, there's that's it, really interesting because there's there's in the Hessian camp there's just basically mourning and low morale. Oh, yeah. And I think the British get a sense of that. Um, it's also that they, they actually call in reinforcements from the garrison in New York City, which hmm. is where Cornwallis gets uh, many of the troops that he marches into New Jersey with. Hmm. And um, it's so it's not so much... Uh, that oh the Hessians can't well it's not so much a condescending the Hessians right. can't do this yeah. but as a, a realization like Real, right numerically morale of their men yeah. yeah 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 okay now what's happening on the American side because as you said we know there's this other thing happening <laughs> up in uh, Saratoga so how does this play out on the American side this temporary victory at Red Bank um, Washington and and. As, as we mentioned before, Washington has had a, a tough year. Uh, yeah. You know, he's defeated at Brandywine. He's, he's outflanked there. He, the, the surprise at Germantown does not go well. Um, the, Wayne gets caught in the Paoli Massacre, Battle mm -hmm. of Paoli. It, it's, so he's not having a good year as commander. Meanwhile, yeah. Gates is, is having a great year up in New York. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, and Washington quickly sends letters to members of Congress. Um, to um, the governor of New York. He actually writes a letter on the 26th. And, and you know, um, John Lawrence soon becomes president of Congress. Mm -hmm. And one of his letters home, he can't resist a little play on words. Um, he, you know, when he's talking about the loss of the Augusta and the Merlin, he says, don't, don't you think these cannoneers at Fort Mifflin deserve to be canonized for their service? Uh, um, and, and Congress <laughs> responds very positively. Yeah. There's, they actually send a communication to our emissaries in Europe at the court of France. And now again, Fort Mercer is much closer to Congress, who is then in York. And so right. they, they have much more detail as to what was happening. And so they send this letter with the details of the de successful defense at Fort Mercer and the sinking of the Augusta and Merlin. And they even, oh, and by the way, 
um, it seems something important happened in New York because they, they really don't have the details yet. Right. Right. But they but they do include and this line really jumped out to me. Make the best use of this information to impress our friends and oppress our enemies. So <laughs> spread this spread this information yeah. far and wide. That's and and did they? Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, part of my case in, in the book is, you know, that, that this part of the, the Philadelphia campaign is important because it if Hal had succeeded, if he had been able to undertake anything beyond Philadelphia um, or if he had managed to to inflict a major defeat on Washington's army or, say, take mm -hmm. part of the Congress, it would it would definitely reduce the significance of oh, yeah. Saratoga. Oh, definitely. Um, and, and at the sa same time, there is the Conway cabal happening. That is, is there an attempt by other officers to oust Washington as commander? And you can imagine what would have happened had his army been part of his army been taken, Congress been captured, or even an easier victory for the British at Fort Mercer. I mean, they have this overwhelming power they're able to bring to bear. Yeah. And at, at the end, Washington preserves his army, which is he, mm -hmm. he's coming to see is the real goal. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, I think Mark Lender in his book on the cabal even talks about the, the defense of the and, and when all is said and done, I, I think many in Congress um, had extravagant hopes. You know, they, they felt that maybe the British could be turned back by these defenses, when in reality, yeah. it's, it's a delaying action. Yeah, but it ends up being a very successful one. Um, the the only, you know, Hal's only move afterwards, early December, he marches out to White Marsh to try and goad Washington, and they spend a few days skirmishing, and, and but Washington won't take the bait, and you know how how marches back and then resigns. You know, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So it's fascinating. So. We've been talking with Jim McIntyre from the Moraine Valley Community College Authority on the Delaware camp on the Philadelphia campaign, and we've been talking about Fort Mercer in Red Bank, New Jersey. I suppose best known to us as the hometown of Count Basie, but also scene of this valiant defense of Fort Mercer in 1777. So thank you, Jim, for joining us. Thank you, Bob, for having me. Great. And so thank you all for joining us for the Rev 250 podcast. Revolution 250 is a consortium of about 70 organizations looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution's 250th anniversary and really happy to be able to talk about events like this one with Jim, with folks like Jim, who uh, know, knows the story and knows much more. So, um, and, you know, we thought initially our listeners would be a handful of folks in and around New England, but we actually have um, listeners in places like Medford, Massachusetts, close to home, as well as Mumbai and Mandeville, Louisiana, and Malta, and all kinds of places in between. So thank you all for joining us, and thanks to Jonathan Lane, our man behind the curtain. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Jim McIntyre. Thank you.